After a recent series of high profile flops, it's fantastic to finally see an RTS launch which is enjoyed by both fans and critics. Sins of a Solar Empire 2 is the sequel to the much loved original from 2008, which also had a number of subsequent expansion packs. Despite the fairly unanimous acclaim so far, there is one notable and high profile exception to this. Gaming juggernaut IGN came out with one of the first reviews of the game and they essentially panned it, giving it 5 out of 10 and the reviewer even claimed they were worse off for having played the game at all. Given the massive reach that IGN has, if you google the game, the third thing that appears on the page is literally 5 out of 10 staring you in the face. As somebody who has been enjoying the game, I'm perhaps slightly biased, but let's take a look at what it has to offer and decide whether that 5 out of 10 rating is at all fair. Sins looks to combine two elements of the strategy genre, featuring real-time and 4x gameplay. 4x can trace its roots back to tabletop board gaming, most notably Stellar Conquest from the 1970s. It stands for Explore, Expand, Exploit and Exterminate. Compared to your typical PC strategy game, ones of the 4x subgenre tend to have much longer matches and they tend to feature certain re recurring features including a technology tree, detailed diplomacy, several win conditions, not just military conquest, and much more detail and depth in terms of the systems within the game. Another mainstay tends to be the fact that these games are often turn-based, and if not turn-based, they can be paused and the speed of the game can be increased and decreased. For many gamers, the developer Sid Meier is synonymous with the 4X genre, particularly his much-loved Civilization series, which is now into its seventh installment. The 4X element of Sins can be described as relatively light, in the sense that you can play it as a straight-up real-time strategy game, but the detail and the depth is there if you choose to access it. I tend to let the game run, and then at particularly important times such as setting up a new planet, making research policy choices, or preparing for a big battle, I will pause the game and make sure everything is set up to my liking. The version of the game which I've been playing is the one which accompanied the official Steam launch in August. I'll explain the importance of this a bit later. When launching the game for the first time, you're greeted with a number of tutorials which cover all the main gameplay mechanics as well as the user interface. I found the pacing of these to be quite good in terms of you're able to skip elements which you find too simple and it's not too onerous to get through these tutorials in say 30 minutes. The tutorials are optional and once you feel like you're ready to play the main game, I think the single player versus AI is a great place to begin. There are a wide variety of pre-created maps to play on, catering for one versus one all the way up to large scale battles featuring many players at once. There are also various different types of formations and structures, so you have ones which are symmetrical, ones which have choke points, and of course, like any good game with 4x features, you can generate your own maps with a set of parameters such as the number of non-player factions, the resource quantity, number of star systems, and everything to your liking. There are three distinct playable races, which make a return from the original. These are the Advent, the Vasari, and the Tech. I would argue there are actually six distinct playable races, because within each of the main three, there are two sub-factions with their own unique items, mechanics, research tree, and these differences are not just superficial, it plays differently each time. Now having set up your map and chosen your race and its sub-faction, you jump straight into the game and you're greeted with the choice of a free capital ship. Again, these are unique amongst the sub-factions. The capital ships each have their own unique strengths. Some of them are straight up combat vessels with heavy weaponry, others are more focused on colonising new planets. Some are more defensive in nature and they have various utility and support features such as nanobots to repair your fleet. Some are even more like aircraft carriers, carrying numbers of small fighters and bombers with them. You start each game having colonised a home planet, and within its orbit you can build a combination of civilian and military structures. Now you have a supply cap of sorts for these which can be expanded. Military structures include things such as floating missile batteries or lasers orbiting the planet, or perhaps space stations with combat capabilities whereas civilian structures tend to be things such as science satellites or production facilities such as factories. Now the planets themselves can be upgraded across a number of categories. Essentially these are generating resources for you, so you're mining from the surface, you can also build mining stations on asteroids orbiting the planet, 
you're also generating credit income and you can upgrade these facilities you can upgrade the defensive capabilities of the planet essentially increasing its health bar or you could increase the supply cap on military or civilian structures allowing you to build more stuff in orbit there are a wide variety of planets moons and asteroid fields which you can move into and potentially colonize each of these generates its own unique mix of resource income and the variety is further enhanced by the fact that they may also have orbiting asteroids which again can be mined to resources it's not just a case of seeing a planet and colonizing a planet often you must have the requisite technology research in order to be able to actually colonize some of these harsher types of planets such as volcanic or crystalline planets and of course it's also a case of scouting and being strategic you can't just pick a faraway planet in a different star system and decide to colonize it and expect to be able to defend that easily you need to think about how close it is to your other colonized planets and how quickly it could be reinforced by incoming support vessels and then it's also a case of considering your resource income mix and thinking what kind of planets do i need to add to improve my economy and is it feasible to research towards colonizing those types of planets i've mentioned the idea of conducting research a few times now and this would not be a true 4x inspired game without featuring an extensive research tree full of technologies which you can unlock and in sins 2 there is a military and a civilian tree if you've played civilization or age of empires then this should all look quite familiar to you essentially within each of the two distinct research trees there are five tiers and these tiers are expensive to unlock but once you do any of the technologies within can then be researched assuming you've completed the prerequisite technologies for example you couldn't jump straight into the third level of gauss weaponry having not researched one and two previously now as i said these tiers are big resource investment and i would say they're very similar to age of empires in terms of i see them like upgrading to a new age you know bronze age to iron age kind of idea and there's a lot of planning involved in terms of are there technologies in a particular tier that you really want to target and rush up towards if so you go for it and you do also unlock permanent bonuses when you unlock these tiers so the military ones tend to have military applications such as improving the strength of your ships your shields your health your hull whereas civilian ones tend to be credit income across your empire i find the research trees to be very nice to look at and intuitive to use i'm particularly fond of the search bar which i find very powerful for example you could put goss into the search and it would show you all the technologies which you can research which upgrade your goss weaponry and it would also tell you the ships impacted as well as the military structures such as space stations which use goss weaponry another system or resource which you have available to you is influence which is used in your relations with the independent or smaller factions there could be several of these small independent factions within any given game and they're neutral to all player and ai controlled player characters and essentially using your influence you can build up relations with these and it goes in tiers much like the research and as you unlock increasingly strong connections with these factions you gain access to increasingly powerful perks each independent faction has its own unique perks and abilities which you can then unlock to your benefit and it's randomized so each time you play the game you could get something new and i really think it does add to the variety and the flavor of the game as opposed to civ where i found the city states just to be a pain and i'd often turn them off in sins it really does add to the the experience so once you've upgraded your home planet you've explored your nearby solar system maybe you've colonized a few new planets you've met some independent factions and you've looked at the research tree maybe you're thinking about building a giant armada and crushing all your enemies each sub-faction has a huge variety of ships to choose from ranging from small fighters to frigates the capital ships and the mighty titan which is a uh, unique you can only have one within your fleet type of ship which takes a hell of a lot of research and investment to reach now most of these ships are behind research technologies which have to be unlocked and there are also a lot of different upgrade technologies associated with different types of ships so the decision you have to make is do you want to have a wide diversified fleet of ships with all different types or do you want to focus heavily on a small subset of those and upgrade them? Now there are two different types of factories which produce these ships which are based on the size of the vessel. 
three if you include Titans, which have their own unique factory. And you have to consider your various colonized planets, the number of factories these support, and then think about how many ships you can construct or potentially rebuild after a brutal battle. There's also a lot of static defense you can build in this game around your colonized planets. So perhaps you can expand in one direction, fortify the planet on the extremities with lots of turrets, space stations and the like, whilst having your ships on the other side of the galaxy, essentially. Once you do have yourself a nice big army of uh, ships to control, there are two main ways to do this. You can either have control groups, very much like Starcraft, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you can also have fleets, which are similar. It's like groupings of ships together, and you can quite easily add and remove from these fleets and create new fleets and subsets of these. And once you get used to using it, it is quite intuitive and quite easy to take a quick visual snapshot of a fleet and see, yes, I've got 23 frigates and two cattle ships and all the rest. So once you get used to it, it's quite good. Another important consideration is the idea of having your fleet move in formation versus moving as quickly as possible. The capital and titan ships have a very slow turning speed and they're not very agile, whereas the smaller vessels can get to their destination much quicker. So do you want that or do you want the entire fleet to warp in together in unison for a large coordinated attack? I found the combat to be very satisfying with great strategic depth. I was particularly interested by the idea of trying to diversify your fleet of ships versus the temptation to upgrade a few particular favorites and just spam those types of units because each vessel has its own unique strengths and weaknesses and if you don't have an answer to a particular threat then you can be vulnerable. A capital ship unsupported can be brought down by a swarm of bombers if not followed by your own fighters. If you do eventually tire of the base gameplay You'd be pleased to know there is a very strong history of modding within the Sins franchise, and this seems to be integrated directly into the client with Sins 2 mod IO support. Now these modifications, which are largely community created, can range from something mundane such as a quality of life fix in the menus, to making the lasers more pew pew, to really ambitious projects which overhaul the entire game. If you consider that the last expansion for the original which is called Rebellion, released more than 10 years ago, and is still receiving really comprehensive mod launches to this day. You can very much see that there's potential for this game to have an enduring legacy, and I think it's a real positive sign that the mod element is really front and center, well integrated, and there's lots of documentation provided by the developers in terms of how to get the most out of the Iron Engine 3, which is what they use to create the game. It will probably come as no great surprise that two of the most prominent mods for the original were Star Wars and Star Trek themed. Amongst a group of sci-fi fans that's no great surprise I suppose. So you can expect to see your favourite franchise represented in Sins 2. Although I do think there will also be new projects. People trying to create their own campaigns, their own scenario packs, their own single player maps. Or maybe something small scale like design their own ship. The other game modes which will also keep people occupied for a long time I think is the multiplayer which is very much like the single player except you can bring in other player characters. You can also keep the AI so you can have a combination it could be humans versus computers or mix things up and you play on the same kind of maps as the single player. And one feature I think is really interesting is that you could take a, a single player game and play through part of the game and then you could save it in that current state load that in to multiplayer and host a game in multiplayer and invite your friends in to join you at that stage of the game. So perhaps you're stuck in a particular battle, you don't know how to proceed or you just want to mix things up or share a really interesting randomly generated map which you've created. Then you can do that. I know a criticism of the early access was that the multiplayer game browser was essentially non-existent and I'm pleased to say with the Steam launch there was now a functional if not rudimentary map and game browser and does the job, certainly. One thing I really want to highlight about this game which I found hugely impressive is the incredible amount of detail which is available. And this detail may not be apparent if you are say an IGN journalist who spends five minutes reviewing the game, but if you give it some time then gradually this emerges and I think it's done in a clever way because they really try not to overwhelm you at first. The detail is there but you have to choose to seek it out, so to speak. One minor but immediately apparent example of this is 
When you begin a new game, you may start with a couple of scout ships, which automatically start exploring your nearby solar system and discovering new planets for you to colonize. You can choose to take manual control of these and direct exactly where you want to explore. Other examples are very much kind of quality of life automations. So when you give a construction order to build a new planetary orbit item, so military satellite or civilian, then your construction vessels will automatically gravitate towards that and start building. You could control that manually and try to min-max things a little bit. Maybe you can optimize more. But for most players and most use cases, this will be perfectly fine automated. Another example would be the idea of positioning these in orbit. You can manually place all of your orbital structures or you can hold down control and the game will find a best fit and put them in a reasonable position, which in most cases will do the job just fine as well. Most tooltips, such as when you mouse over a ship or a planet, will have a fairly detailed base view, but if you hold down Alt, you can see the full detail, and you can see there are many other sort of stats and uh, traits within these which are basically hidden from you unless you choose to see them, and you can see the true scale of the, the detail and the subsystems underpinning the game mechanics. A good example, I think, of the detail which is available is the orbital planning view where, as I say, you can just you can just plonk down your structures haphazardly and you can just colonize planets, you know, without much care to sort of long-term planning. But you can actually go in and model in, adv in a year in advance, I think it is, the movement of these celestial bodies, so these planets and their orbits. And based on how these planets move, they will create and destroy links between them. So maybe a planet which you've colonized and now has an immediate path between that and your home world, in a year's time it will have shifted and the path will be much more sort of circuitous and it's harder to reinforce and defend that planet that you've now colonized. So there's a lot to think about but you can also just play the game rather mindlessly, like an RTS, and not worry about it. So if I were a video game critic and I was reviewing this game, where would I score it out of 10? And what are my criticisms? Because so far I've been largely positive. I think first and foremost, the game does still feel like it's recently emerged from early access and it feels a bit like a sandbox. I think it will still have massive replayability, but it does just need more stuff so to speak. It needs an expanded soundtrack, it needs more factions or sub-factions, and I think over time this can be built. DLCs, expansions, things like that. My other small criticism would be the UI, which it does take quite a bit of getting used to. It's not super intuitive. When I think of a 4X inspired game, I think of different victory conditions. I think of diplomacy, think of some sort of social or technological way of winning the game and right now in Sins 2 you basically blow stuff up and win by military conquest or nothing. Now I would definitely agree that the diplomacy part of the game is basic at best and that is definitely something I would like to see expanded. I would also point out that the previous expansion for Sins, so Rebellion, which came out 10 plus years ago, had multiple win conditions. So this is a bit of a step backwards. Now while the Civilization franchise has never been held back by its lack of a full-blown single-player campaign, there's definitely an opportunity here to improve Sins 2, at least by having scenario packs. And if you look at the premium version of the game in the purchase options, they are planning a Paths to Power scenario pack, which will feature custom scenarios with unique starting conditions and victory conditions. So that's essentially what I'm looking for different win conditions, a bit of a single player element, and that's a lot of content for people to get their teeth into and enjoy for years to come. So I think my impression is that the game has been launched in the sort of minimum acceptable finished state that it could be. And the base game, the engine, the research trees, the six sub-factions, it's all good, it's all polished, it plays well, it's enjoyable, it's replayable, but it could be so much more. And there's a bunch of, I'd say, easy wins out there for the developers to add to the game. And they're planning to. If you look at the premium options and the features they're adding in the future, these things are coming. But is that the way of the industry now? That you you get the base game, the sandbox, the the minimum, and then over time you get 
you know, what used to just come on the on the CD or the, the ROM or whatever else. I don't know. I feel like they're not out of keeping with the rest of the industry, but it is a bit of a shame. Considering games such as Civilization get an easy 9.5 or 9 out of 10 without single player, without really innovating from one addition to the next, I think it's fair to give this game 8 out of 10 in its current state and have real excitement for it becoming something really, really good in the future. With a bit more sort of depth to it in terms of being fully featured, scenarios, single player, expanded soundtrack, more units, the planned fourth faction on the way, all of that could make it a 9 or a 10, to be honest. It's polished, it's fun, it's a successful launch of a strategy game, which is, <laughs> it's been a while. So yeah, 8 out of 10 for me. So now we come back to the question of the 5 out of 10 IGN review and whether we think that is doing the game justice. It's important to understand that the game for the best part of two years was an Epic Store exclusive early access title. Until a couple of months prior to the recent Steam launch where developer Stardot Games removed all early access branding from the page, essentially signalling that the game was released and ready. On the very same day this happened, as confirmed by IGN staff, they started writing a review based on that Epic Store version of the game. And what we know is that that version was up to a year old in some places, and the developers had been planning for a couple of months later to do a big Steam launch and to coincide that with a giant content patch which would address a number of issues with the game. I suspect what happened is that Stardock had an exclusive contract with the Epic Store where they were obligated to launch the full game onto the Epic Store exclusively before being able to put it on other platforms such as Steam. I presume that the, the length of time that passed between the removal of the early access branding on Epic and the Steam launch of the game equates to the period in the contract where they were forced to be exclusive to Epic. Well, when I say forced, I mean they signed the bloody contract and I'm sure they were supported financially in terms of resources and everything else by doing so. So essentially what I think Stardock tried to do is stealth launch the game on the Epic Store and do the bare minimum to meet the obligations of their exclusivity contract. And they held back all of the advertising, all of the key content patches for the game and everything, saving it all for the upcoming Steam launch where they would heavily advertise the game and announce that it was finally released and ready to play. In the meantime, they removed all the early access branding on Epic and it was to anyone browsing the Epic store, a finished game ready to buy and play. Unfortunately for Stardock, that's exactly what IGN did. They bought the game on Epic and they played it and reviewed it on Epic and they gave it a hammering. 5 out of 10. The game was described as as bare bones as can be and there are a number of criticisms about the game being buggy which I can't really verify because I didn't experience those bugs and I'm now playing a more updated and polished version. But what I can say is that there were some criticisms which were unwarranted and just belied a lack of game knowledge and understanding on the part of the reviewer. And if they'd bother to play the game more and understand the underlying systems or read the tooltips properly, the issues they faced would not have happened. They were largely self-inflicted. I definitely take issue with some of the language used in the review when they describe themselves as being poorer for having played the game and various other hyperbole. They were just very eager to dunk on this game. And given the, the sort of wider backdrop of the genre struggling and a few high profile, extremely anticipated and then disappointing launches such as Homeworld 3 and Stormgate of course, I think they've got a bit of a duty to be fair and impartial here instead of trying to slam dunk on Sins 2 with a bunch of uh, witty zingers, so to speak. I definitely got rubbed up the wrong way reading all this nonsense. Now there's obviously some uh, context between Epic, Stardock and IGN which we are not privy to, but the thing that really strikes me is that they literally reviewed this game on the day that the branding was removed from the Epic Store. The stealth removal, okay? And they were quick to publish this 5 out of 10 review. The SEO has bumped it to the third result on Google associated with Sins 2 and everyone that looks for the game sees 5 out of 10. Now, 
the game has been launched on Steam with a patch which fixes basically every issue the reviewer had which was legitimate and the ones that were not legitimate which were most of them they can just you know they go whistle to be honest but they're dragging their heels now they have not updated their review based on the steam launch they haven't signaled any intention to do so so essentially yes stardock tried something maybe a little bit cheeky and they've been punished as hard as they possibly could be for that by ign to the point where it seems deliberate and vindictive in summary, I think this is just not a good look, or an L, as they say, for all three parties involved. Starting with the Epic Store, and it's not really their fault, they signed an exclusivity contract in good faith, and imagine a developer thinking your platform is so unappealing that they would rather stealth launch to try and fulfill the contract than put any effort into advertising and promoting the launch of their game on your platform. I mean, that says it all about the competitiveness of Epic versus Steam as a distribution platform. Turning to IGN, this just adds fuel to the, the long-standing argument amongst gamers that the platform should be ignored and that it is harmful to the industry and that they use their review scores as political leverage against publishers, developers and the like. So just really a bad look all around on their part. And personally, I found the review to be in bad taste. I think the fact that they are not updating the review is poor, extremely poor and deliberate, and I just think it's uh, clickbaity and lazy journalism, especially when they're so quick to hand out nine, nine and a half to Civilization, when that game has definitely peaked, is on the decline, and has barely innovated in various iterations and expansions, and is DLC'd out the wazoo nowadays as well. Now, turning last to Stardock Games, I think... Uh, there's a history of them bungling launches of their much-loved franchise titles, so they definitely have to take quite a bit of blame here as well. They definitely tried to pull a fast one with the whole stealth launching on Epic, and they probably took advantage of Epic to some extent. Obviously, we're now moving into speculation and guesswork, but I do think that they, they got some support from Epic in exchange for being exclusive. They used that support to help develop the game, and then they decided they wanted their cake and eat it as well. So they tried to get out of the deal by, you know, essentially not launching it. Yes, they launched it, but not really. So you could argue in some ways that maybe IGN are, are sort of uh, clapping back against that poor practice, that underhand shady trick they tried to pull and holding them accountable and punishing them for it. But I think that's giving too much credit to a shitty outlet, to be honest, like IGN. Yeah, I mean, Stardock have to look at themselves here and take some blame as well. But ultimately, I think it's just a loss for the genre as a whole. Because if you go and play the game on Steam today, it is not a 5 out of 10 game. It's a solid 7 or 8. The fans say it. The fans say 9. The critics say 8. It's well received universally, apart from IGN. And the industry doesn't need this. The genre does not need this. The genre needs a success. Homeworld, Stormgate, they've all been real disappointments, and this is not one of them. But it's been treated as such because of nonsense involving the launch and the early access. My advice to you would be just to try it yourself and reserve judgement. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the game. Now, I was so confused by all these shenanigans that I actually thought the game was still in early access when I made my previous video, where I showcased 19 upcoming RTS titles which I think could save the genre one of which was Sins 2, but there are 18 more which I do think are worth a look, so if that interests you, then click on the link below.